Okay, we're back with another episode of The Breakdown, episode number 18. Got a very special guest for you here at the Alive and Social Network in South Minneapolis. This show is, of course, brought to you by Coors Light. Again, once we are going with episode number 18. I am joined, as always, by former Twins right-hander Cole DeVries. What's up? Tom Schreier, <laughs> purveyor and creator. Of why, why was that so funny? Because last time I said I was right-handed and then explained it how I'm left-handed, too, a little oh, bit. Oh, you completely derailed the entire Yeah, <laughs> That's Tom Schreier, by the way, purveyor and creator or co-creator of Cold Omaha. If you haven't checked that out, at Cold Omaha MN on Twitter. Joined by the A-Train, I just decided to call him that, Aaron Tro producing. And our very special guest today of BP Wrigleyville, Baseball Prospectus, formerly Fox Sports, just a bit outside... Matt Trueblood, how are we doing, Matt? Doing great. I am a lefty all the way. Oh, wow. So wow. we are getting some left-handed power on this side of the table. Uh, belated congratulations to Matt on the birth of his third child, I believe, what, about uh, six weeks ago, eight weeks ago? Seven weeks today, yeah. Uh, right on. Nice. So uh, Matt is a Minnesota resident, joining us in person, in the flesh. Uh, it's the second time I've been in your presence. Uh, we met at Target Field probably, what, October, August or September, I think it was, maybe? Yeah, late September. Uh, a, so you live in the area. Have you lived here very long? Uh, since 2011. So, so qu- a quite a uh, bit longer than I had suspected. I know you were an Illinois native, but so what's the story? How'd you land in Minnesota? Uh, my wife's actually from here. So we met at school in Chicago and moved out here after we graduated. Was that a hard sell for you? Uh, I mean, <laughs> weather-wise and losing Chicago, yes. Yeah, but... he, rolled his, he, rolled his eyes, he rolled his eyes pretty hard. Yeah. Uh, where'd you guys go to school? Loyola. Okay, so... Yeah. Met there. That, that's pretty great. <laughs> we do have a special guest that I for, I neglected to mention. A is that a Springer or a Cocker Spaniel? Ah, uh, Cocker. And, God, and she's just being a little pain. Right yep. <laughs> so babe, baby is back in the house. I think this is probably her, probably her third or fourth edition visiting us here at the studio. Whole heap of fun when she behaves, but that has been <sighs> not too frequently. <laughs> In previous well, the problem is, is that they got these little holes in the wall where I'm guessing a mouse has crawled in at one point, and she's a big time mouser, and so she's going nuts on those. <laughs> yeah, for people who aren't aware, the Live Social Network, we kind of hang out in this this house that they've purchased in South Minneapolis. It's a super cool old house, and it's got those little like Tom and Jerry style, yeah, almost kind of uh, mouse holes that. <laughs> <laughs> from just, yeah, from, from the knots from just the wood. The wood. Yeah, so, and, so it's absolutely driving her bonkers. Yep. And the, the last time she was here, she knocked over that table too. So we're well. gonna have to come up with a, a better <laughs> fortress to keep her out of there. Oh god. Uh, so we have been coming to you guys every two weeks or so for the duration of the off season, basically. And not as much going on, especially since it's a Twins podcast, and it's been a pretty quiet Twins off season, especially recently during the winter meetings in Nashville as well. Can't say as much for Mr. Trueblood's team. He's a Cubs guy. But I, I do want to, as we're about a week away from the holidays here, what do you, what's on your Christmas list, guys? Let's start with the guest, Matt, who I don't know how much more you can ask for. You got another baby. You have had a dream off season as a Cubs fan. But what is on your personal Christmas list for next week or your, your holiday list, whatever you're, you're really searching for or seeking? I, uh, I'll stick to baseball and say I'm still waiting for the Twins to sort of flesh out some depth spots on their roster, True. Yep. and I'm not yep. sure if that's coming at this point. But uh, they're just these little places where they they need to be a little more ready for something not to go 100 percent right. So yeah, a stronger contingency in a number of places. I, I agree with that. From a personal standpoint, I'm asking for a little bit more upgraded uh, Fitbit. There that's what go. I asked my wife for. I know she's got me some more winter clothes. I'm trying to lose some weight, so I'm trying to get some better fitting stuff. So, got my fingers crossed. I know she already bought one thing because she's not very good at keeping a secret. <laughs> However, we'll see what else is in store next week when, when the holidays come around. Cole, how about you? Um, well, I've actually already had Christmas. Oh, wow. Yep, my family, we always do it uh, a week or two early because we're always usually gone. And traveling or doing whatever sure and so uh i actually got the one present that i was hoping for it was a (laughs) this sounds just kind of like a loser gift but um (laughs) it was a screen calibrator for my laptop for my photo processing with my pictures so i got that and i was playing around with last night and it was pretty impressive that sounds it sounds pretty esoteric pretty narrow band of people that that might appeal to. You also did get engaged in the last month or so. Yes. So uh, you've obviously had some good things going on too. Tom, 
Yeah. I I would love to hear what's on your wish list. Yeah, I'm trying to think of something super random. Honestly, I just need new clothes because I wear the same stuff all the time. So a lot of shirts and stuff. Especially if you're going to be appearing on TV at Timberwolves games. Yeah, right? exactly. The beard is new. Yeah, or new it is. How long have you been working on that? November, November. And okay. I just kind of kept it through. I thought it was going to snow and be cold because it's Minnesota and it yeah. hasn't been. Yesterday so. was wild yeah. with weather, especially the sleet, the snow, the rain, and kind of all in the span of about a half hour up in St. Michael where I was at. I think it was pretty yeah, similar. similar down here too. But yeah, microphones. We're trying to launch Cold Omaha in January, so we need like equipment to do podcasts. And oh, stuff right. Like that. Yeah, we're we're going to talk about that after the show off the air. Yeah, about maybe doing another little show. So that'll be a whole lot of fun. A train. What are you? Are you? Are you wishing for a Kevin Martin trade? Yeah. <laughs> he I just guess. nods. He's, he, that's all he's really looking for is a Kevin Martin trade. We were talking about that off the air too. You know, not necessarily a great basketball mind here, but that is the big thing going for the Timberwolves right now is trying to figure out how these pieces work. And everybody that I've talked to kind of feels like Sam Mitchell's not really doing a great job of putting all those pieces together. Yeah, I mean, and especially using Kevin Martin because he wants to be a starter, and it's a 33-year-old player, I think, on a very young team. And, and he's, he's played well enough to maybe be a starter in the league. I think if you send him to the right situation, he'd probably be willing to come off the bench on a winning team yeah. and play 24. 20 some minutes a night rather than whatever. I don't know that he's playing more than 30 minutes a night for the Wolves, but I think if you were to give him his choice, he would take a trade to a better team and play a little less and that wouldn't need to be the starter so much. But I don't think he would appreciate, you know, playing behind Shabazz Muhammad or, or Levine, who are unproven he's players. He's just, killing it right now, though. Yeah. Zach Levine. Yeah. I mean, he's been, he's been fantastic. He's starting to play to the potential that you hope for when you draft a guy like that in the lottery. So, yeah. Um, as far as the shopping list for the team, I think you've already kind of hit the nail on the head, Matt, for the Twins. With the Cubs, for you, we'll, we'll talk about the Twins on our side, but for the Cubs, what what is one thing you're kind of in search of? I think I got a pretty good idea of what angle you're going to go with, but what, what do you want to see Jed Hoyer in that front office address as they come into 2016? Well, there there isn't much <laughs> left on the list because they've gone out and been really aggressive sure uh, not only with the big moves that have caught the headlines um obviously showing up the lineup in the middle of the rotation but they've fleshed out their pitching depth a lot with just fringe they picked up uh, rex brothers a couple of guys signed to major league deals who have never actually pitched outside the minors oh yeah uh, i saw a couple of those some scouting fines hopefully and uh trevor cahill you know they've really shored up the back end of the pitching staff too I guess the thing that we'll keep an eye on uh, between now and spring training for them is whether the opportunity crops up to spend some of their prospect capital, which they haven't had to tap into, and that's one of the amazing things about mm -hmm. the offseason they've had. So they've still got a pretty deep farm system and a lot of guys who could attract that number two starter who might even slide John Lester down the rotation a, a rung um, or sort of a dominant Back end bullpen guy, someone to compliment Hector Rondon, who's a very good closer. They don't really need to replace him, but to give him a little more depth uh, in those high leverage spots. One of those two, if it becomes an option for them, they're going to pursue it. But I don't feel like they, I don't think they feel like they have a pressing need at this point, something they have to go chase down. Yeah, that makes sense. A team that's bound to be that good and won 96 games this last year 97. That, 97. Yep. Uh, 96, I think, was Pittsburgh, right? 98 was pitched. Okay, so I, I always get that confused. Uh, two teams that don't need to really overextend themselves to get better. You know, you got to keep track of what everyone else is doing and kind of maintain. But no, I, I agree with all those things. Uh, on the twin side, guys, and I'll throw the ball to you too. For me, they didn't go out and get the big guy that I want them to. They haven't really done any bullpen spending. I still think you could see maybe in Antonio Bastardo, uh, Jim Suhan recommended Tony Sip today. Tony Sip signed six days ago, so that's. <laughs> that's going to work That's going to complicate well. things just a little bit. Had but I, I don't think the Astros want to work on a timeshare with Tony Sipp, who said the Twins were a world-class organization. There just wasn't a fit for him. I would say, you know, if they do go out and sign another free agent, it's going to be a relief pitcher, probably a left-hander, at the expense of maybe p taking Ryan O'Rourke off the 40. It is a full 40-man roster, and in that sense, I don't get the feeling that they have a lot of moves left to make. The other thing I think they could do is maybe trade an Oswaldo Arcia or... Tommy Malone for a left-handed reliever. I, I don't know that. I don't know you could trade, let's say, Oswaldo Arcia for Will Smith to the Brewers. It's a convenient-looking trade because you'd have the Arcia brothers in Milwaukee. They don't need another corner outfielder, so 
you know, that might be what the Twins would like to do. They might ask for something like Jorge Polanco or something better. I don't know. You could also Malone to the Orioles for Brian Mattis. So those are just trades that I've seen on Twins Daily. That, those are ideas I've kind of poked around. The issue for me is you're giving up assets that you have in-house to, to go after guys that you could sign without having to give up anything for. So I'm kind of at this conflicting stage of the offseason where I'm not really sure what direction I want the team to go in, but I see and sense the frustration of fans that they're just not doing anything. I think the biggest concern is could you potentially have a Sano Rosario um, Arcia outfield? And that's terrifying. And why do you go from having this future where people are excited? I know, cold. The cold five ball pitcher in the room I know. Is, yeah. is, has just broken into a cold sweat thinking about pitching in front of that defense. <laughs> oh, that, that's one that will give you nightmares unless you're Kyle Gibson. So. Yeah, yeah, the 50, 50 some percent ground ball guy. Yeah. You know, he, he probably doesn't mind having statues in the outfield because he's going to be just fine. But you went from kind of this enticing. You know, future where you would have Hicks, you had um, Buxton, and you had Rosario, which was a great defense. It would, it would catch everything. Death, and, death the flying things. Yeah, and so you either go, man, John Ryan Murphy better be really good, or what did you do to your outfield that really looked like it had potential? Exactly. I, I mean, that's frustrating. Th- that's one thing that really kind of disappointed me, and I know we talked about this on a, a preview, previous episode, that back when I was playing in the big leagues with them, you know, we had an unreal outfield with... Uh, Span and Revere mm-hmm. out there, and also Willingham, but but, uh, but it didn't matter as much who was in left. <laughs> if you had two really good guys. Well, yeah, <laughs> and and those guys were so fast that you could shade over, so you could cut off almost a third of the range that Willingham needed to cover mm-hmm. because those other guys were so good. And then all of a sudden, I felt like we were getting back to that, if not far better, because we had you had Hicks or Buxton in center. And then whoever would be playing the other corner, and then you've got Rosario right. in that other corner outfield spot, and all of a sudden you have three guys who are really fast, have, at the worst, decent arms. But all center field caliber guys. Exactly, yeah, playing in all the positions. And so I was starting to get really excited for all the pitchers at the outfield that they were going to have, and the possibility of such less runs scored in games because of what those guys are going to be able to do. And now it's kind of... A flip of the coin as to who and what is going to be out there. Yeah, and that would have been a better range-wise defensive outfield than Hunter, Lawton, and Jones was. I think that's the, the – I call it a gold standard. It's not a gold standard in the sense that it's going to make anybody forget about the Royals the last couple of years. But for the Twins and the outfields that they have employed with the Rondell Whites and the Josh Willinghams, the Oswaldo Arcias, the Ryan Domitz, you know, when you think about recent history – and then to to do a full 180 and then give up on it really quickly is frustrating. Does it does that signal that they think Byron Buxton's close or Max Kepler is close? It might. It's hard to get a read exactly where the Twins stand on, on all those things. But I, I don't think they want to go into the season with with the outfield that you, you laid out. I, I mean, think that's, that's a terrible. nightmare scenario. I think they would just as soon have Danny Santana in center and Rosario in a corner. Santana's a converted shortstop who can't really play short, he's... he's That's how they're going to start, right? I mean, it might I mean, it be. He's like okay-ish it. in center. Like, he he passes, like, the, the average fan eye test. He doesn't embarrass himself in center field, but <laughs> he's not the kind of guy who's going to hit well enough to justify a spot in the lineup unless things change. And so... Uh, outfield is is obviously in flux, and so we'll, we'll be... I'll be interested to see how that changes. Another thing that came down, I think it was during kind of like the town hall meeting with the Twins brass and season ticket holders was the idea that they were going to give Trevor May the chance to start, but they went so far as to say he's likely ticketed for the bullpen. I I roll my eyes when I think about that. I think you and I, Matt, have had some discussions about Trevor May starting. I've had them with a number of people that I don't consider twins first people, and it seems to me the perception is that he's obviously very good out of the bullpen. Out of the rotation, he's missing the one thing somewhere that could keep him from being a great starter rather than just a, a passable starter. I, I get frustrated from the sense that I don't think they're going to start five guys who are better than Trevor May, which is discouraging. Saw that with Kevin Slowey. I mean, he went to the bullpen when he was clearly better than Nick Blackford at the time. What? I, I don't want to call you an outsider, but from someone who's not necessarily a Twins first guy, what's your perception of Trevor May, and, and how, do you, how do you see this playing out? Mm-hmm. Well, not to sidetrack this toward the Cubs, but if you look back to the Cubs at the start of 2015 or going into that season, um, 
they had Travis Wood, who had had a very good 2013 and a very bad 2014. He's kind of just like May, where it's not so much that he's just missing one thing and you hope you can find it, but that he's a little short on command. He's a little short on consistency. Mm -hmm. He's maybe a little short on being able to miss bats consistently in a starting role. But he, he can do just enough of all of those to be interesting as a starter. Sure. The Cubs let Wood go into the season as the fifth starter. And when he wasn't really cutting it, or at least they felt like they had better options, they slid him into relief, and he dominated down the stretch in short relief. I ultimately think that probably is the best role for Trevor May, because I think, like Wood, he's be a good starter. But I think a smart organization, an aggressive organization, is one that at least gives him that opportunity. Says, you're going to go into April, unless you have a disastrous camp, we're going to give you that opportunity, five, six starts, whatever it is, show us what you've got, and maybe you can stick. And the Twins don't seem inclined to give him that opportunity. I agree with you. That's probably the wrong decision. I think the most frustrating thing from that standpoint with, with May, too, is that it was Mike Pelfrey in his way in 2015. 2016, it's likely to be either Tommy Malone, a perfectly fine lefty but not a stalwart, and then Ricky Nolasco, who's obviously been a, a big-time bust so far for the Twins. Now, if it was Jose Barrios... Tyler Duffy, those kind of guys in the in the back of the Twins rotation, you're like, yeah, let's play, because then you move Trevor May to the back of the bullpen where he's he's just shoving, and 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 again, that's probably where he's more likely to sustain success. And when you look at the success he had as a starter in 2015, even if you're more projecting based on what he should have done with his peripheral statistics, it did take an aberration in control where he cut his walk rate in half for him to be that good. Maybe he can't keep doing that, and maybe the Twins sense that, but I think. And what I want to ask you, Cole, is is from a player standpoint, what does that say to you as a young player? Because you know you were obviously on the on that part of the totem pole in your time in the big leagues, where a team kind of shoehorns you into a role where you realize there's going to be less utilization, and as you've mentioned in the past, less of an opportunity to cash in. Well, I, uh, kind of my situation the year I got called up in in 2012 was really similar to this. I was going into camp and it was minor league camp. It wasn't big league camp. Um, but I went into camp thinking that I was going to be kind of the long reliever in AAA. And that was going to be my spot. When someone got hurt, you know, I was going to go up where I could, <clears throat> I could do the long or I could come in for it. Were, were you coming out starting or relieving? Cause you had a really I good was, stretch as a reliever in the minors. Had yeah, you gone back to starting? No. So that, that previous year I'd had probably one of my better years coming out of the bullpen or, and just in total. And, they told me I was going to be out of the pen. And then all of a sudden in spring training, I kept on starting games. And then I started the season as one of six guys who was in the rotation <laughs> in Rochester. And then I ended up getting called up as a starter. And I never, I didn't like that because you want to know how to prepare yourself going into spring training. And if you're going in under the assumption that you might be a starter or you might be an eighth inning guy, those are such completely opposite roles as to how to prepare yourself that it, it just makes it difficult. And this one of the things that the, that the twins do very frequently that I, I never liked is it's pick a guy like Trevor May, who's got a lot of potential to be one of your guys down the road and give him a spot and just let him sit there. And, 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 and let him figure it out. You know, I, I, they, they like to shift guys around and it's like, okay, he did okay as a starter. He lo he was starting to do better and better, but then you moved him to that seventh, eighth inning guy and he did extremely well. Just lock him in there until you got to get rid of Glenn Perkins. And then mm -hmm. maybe he's your closer or you go out and get someone else, but he did so well. Why are you even thinking about, you know, moving him when, you have depth in the starting rotation that you never have. And so now they need more depth in the bullpen. And he's one of the guys that can help solidify it for you. So you mentioned preparation and that's an interesting buzzword. Is it more difficult from a mental preparation standpoint or a physical preparation standpoint, not knowing your role? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I would say it's a little bit of both because I would say it, it's definitely mentally different because if you're a starter, you are thinking that that every start you got to go out there for five six innings. I mean that that's that's what you need to do. Bullpen, especially being the eighth inning guy, you're only going out there for an 
an inning. And it might only be if you have a lead. Yeah. And so your your mental preparation is completely different, but then also your physical preparation because if you're starting, you're going to be doing workouts that are a little bit more, have endurance as a factor and your lifts are going to be a little bit different where you're that eighth inning guy. I mean, you're your blowout or sellout when, when, when you go out there. And so it, it, all of it is part of it. Tom, your Trevor may hot take what you got. Well, I just think he should have been a starter. And I understand what you're saying that when he has that success, you don't want to kind of monkey with the guy. I, I think you're right. You got to choose, choose what role you want him to be in. I just think when you had, remember back when we said, okay, they traded uh, Revere and span, you have, you know, Vance Worley, who was supposed to be kind of plug and play as a starter, obviously didn't pan out. Um, and then you, you know, is May and Meyer, and I think they got to be directing these guys as a starter and have to make sure that they can't start, I guess, before you really start moving prospects over to the bullpen. I think just because of an innings thing, you just get so many more innings out of a starter. It's something that they've had trouble with in the past. And it's just, it's frustrating to me that the Twins aren't really developing these kind of high end starters. And now you have, what, 27 year old Alex Meyer, who we're not even talking about at all, who is what, Triple A last year? Yeah, had, probably, had probably going to be. Innings. A- Probably cracks the team as the long guy this year, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah, and then you, you know, and then Trevor May, who I think it ju- it just seems like I get, I guess I want to know that he can't start before you start moving to the bullpen. I know he had success there. I just wonder, like last year, that Mike Pelfrey could have had that role, or the, if there's someone else. Keep in mind, Kevin Jepson, who you know when he was traded for, everyone kind of rolled their eyes and go, "Man, typical Twins move." Came in and had success. He was really good. So you know, it's not as though you know, at least in, in those roles, eighth and ninth, you know, you have him pretty solidified. And then later on in his career, if Trevor May really isn't a great starter, maybe he makes a better reliever. And then you say, "Look, forget starting." Oh, it's You're almost like we're talking now. about Mike Pelfrey again. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a weird game of dominoes in that you don't know who replaces May in the rotation when you take him out, or vice versa in the bullpen. It brings up a couple of more frustrating topics for me in that. Now they have no more options on Michael Tonkin. You don't know what you're going to get out of him. He doesn't fit as a long guy because of his profile. And yet you spent the whole season shuttling him back and forth from Rochester to get innings for Brian Dunsing and Blaine Boyer, who you've already said you're not going to bring back. Well, then why were they so important to get innings for in 2015 when, A, you weren't expected to contend, and, B, they pitched fine, but they didn't pitch huge innings for you down the stretch? It's just a, It's just a kind of a baffling strategy for me i want to go over to uh, one more thing before we take our first pause and then we'll come back with a little more twins talk before we hit the cubs michael kadire retired since we last convened i obviously you remember him coming up and kind of being the first guy that ron gardenhire jerked around it was right field second base third base and there was always this feeling that he was not going to settle into who they thought he would be he was a first round pick in 1997 a shortstop out of virginia beach I believe it was Virginia Beach, uh, David Wright's area. I think they played either together or against each other. And then again, together with the Mets this last season. Pretty good career for what he was able to do. You know, Decently athletic guy who didn't play very well defensively, mashed lefties. But he turned into an all right player who cashed in with a couple different contracts after the Twins. What are going to be your memories? Uh, we'll start with Matt about Michael Kadire. And, and what does that mean for the Mets as far as flexibility, too? Well, it doesn't seem to mean a whole lot to the Mets uh, because they, <laughs> they're not going to plunge it back in. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, maybe they're sitting here wishing he'd told them just a few weeks earlier because they got not outbid but beaten out for Ben Zobrist, whom they really wanted. Um, oh yeah, that would have been a huge move for them. Definitely, and they maybe they could have gone a little higher and convinced him to come to New York if they'd known they had that extra twelve million in their budget this year. Uh, for me, I'll I'll remember Kadir from his last days. Well, not his very last days with the Twins. That 2011 stretch was ugly, but Oof, uh, yeah. in 2009 and 2010, he was he was a key cog in those playoff teams, and uh, came up with some really big hits. He was he was a very good hitter, and he was willing to play and able to fake it at a bunch of positions, and that's that's a really valuable asset. You know, it'd be better if he was a great defender at all those positions like Ben Zobrist. Then you would have Ben Zobrist. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's like a fat Ben Zobrist. That's, that's <laughs> tell, tell me I'm wrong. He was, he was the heart and soul of the post Tory Hunter twins. Yeah. I, from, uh, you, you, know, play, yeah. you would have played with him too, I suppose. No, I, I was never up with him. Oh, but, yeah, um, just missed it. Yeah. But I think we missed each other by a just year missed. or something. But, uh, from what I heard from, you know, guys or my buddies who were up during that time, you know, he was, he was one of the leaders. During that stretch, so yeah, you're definitely right. 
I think I think he represents kind of what the Twins lost when they lost those hunters, your Kadires, this and that. That was kind of the culture in this, you know, like remember the twins almost contracted and all that you know they they developed this culture with these young guys that we're going to win the central we're going to kind of be a fun loving young punch and i you know i think it just you could tell the twins are falling apart when guys like that left right you saw kind of what what impact they made um both on the field but also in the joe nathan in the same office joe nathan was the other guy and i think joe nathan had expressed he just wasn't interested in coming back and it was just a culture thing yeah, they didn't like where the twins were headed, and Kadir nailed it with the media. He was just uh, it, that was my first year, I think, reporting, and it just like, even as a young guy who he had no idea who he was, always answered questions, and I think that's why these guys like Hunter Kadir, they get remembered right, right? Kadir goes out with the Players Tribune explaining why you know why he made his decision and whatnot. Hunter goes out beloved. Those guys did it really, really well. Well, and <laughs> Kadir also went out with it. Just kind of showed up on the wire that he had retired, and the Mets are like. They gave it like the shrug emoji. If they did that on Twitter, that would have been pretty much identical to how they answered. So I felt a little bad that that's how it got handled because he deserved a little better than that. But uh, a couple quick news items before we take our first pause. A.J. Ochter, former twin, claimed by the Angels on waivers, just came across the wire now. Not a huge deal, but like to keep track of our old friends. And then Gabe Kapler sticking with the Dodgers, but returning to the role of farm director. I'm a big Gabe Kapler guy. So wherever he settles, I'm a, I'm always going to keep an eye on that. So, so let's do this. Let's take our first pause. When we come back, we'll pick up this twins discussion a little bit, and then we'll get Matt involved with some heavy Cubs discussion on the breakdown. Hey, everybody. My name is Joan Vorderbruggen, and I want you to tune into my new weekly podcast, Joan of Art on the Alive and Social Network. Each week on Joan of Art, we will interview some of the most talented artists from across the Twin Cities. I'm talking painters, costume designers, filmmakers, poets. There's going to be something for everybody. You won't believe some of the things people are making. <laughs> 598,000 light brights. Takumba created the world's largest light bright. Right. So I know that there's a piece that you're working on. It's called How to Have Fun in a Civil War. A friend of mine is like, you're bringing civil war to the state fair. <laughs> you can find the Joan of Art podcast at www.aliveandsocial.com or look on Facebook for Joan of Art podcast. Tune in weekly to Joan of Art as we investigate and celebrate people who make art. I'm never sure how, to, how long to let Cole's stuff run because most of the time it's, <laughs> it's stuff I've never heard before. <laughs> Oh, I I'm love this song. Admitting my ignorance, but it is. Oh, it's Ying Yang Twins. So I'm, I'm definitely featuring Pitbull. Oh. <laughs> yeah. My favorite joke is that when Mark Burley was traded to, is it Toronto that they don't allow pit bulls? Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I wonder if pit bulls allowed oh, in Toronto no. too. I was like, I'm gonna move to Pitbull because if he's not, or I'm gonna move to Toronto because if Pitbull's not allowed out there, that's where I want to be. Anyway, that's that's a horrible joke, and if you have to explain it, it should be retired. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Michael Kadire, um, Twins did have a new wave of minor league signings today. They did mention to who all had been invited to spring training. Here are the highlights: Buck Britton. <laughs> just that's not really a highlight, but that's I believe is it Zach Britton's younger brother. I think so, or older brother actually. I think a position player who probably spent the year at AAA is just kind of a depth guy. Brandon Kinsler, who's had his moments with the Brewers, uh, maybe the Blaine Boyer style signing, ground ball guy, a little less success than Boyer had beforehand, but you can kind of see what mold they're operating in here. Wilfredo Tovar coming over from the Mets system. I believe he's a glove first shortstop. Yeah, who... in 1973, I think. What's that? Oh, yeah. It, sounds <laughs> it just straight, sounds like it a sounds name straight out of, yeah. You know, 40, the, 40. He could have been a Yankee in the, in the mid 70s. Like, okay, yeah. You're definitely right. Or Cesar Tovar with the Twins, you know, back then, playing all the different positions. Uh, defensive first, shortstop, could have a chance to crack the team as a utility guy, but, you know, probably not a strong chance. Uh, the best name of, of them all so far, and the one I know Tom likes the most, Buddy Boschers. Am I mm-hmm. saying that right? Boschers? Uh, we're getting a collective shrug from the room. Uh, a decent left, he throws in the, the low 90s, which I'm sure everybody loves to hear uh, as far as Twins fans. <laughs> Uh, old friend Darren Mastriani, who I believe you said you had played with for a couple seasons in the minor leagues. Yep. Well, uh, both minor leagues and big leagues. And, we're, and maybe we're an kind of up and down during that same time. Maybe a very outside chance to crack the team as a fourth outfielder. He did not play particularly well in the Phillies 
minor league system last year, but there's some familiarity, there's some defense, and it depends on what the starting outfield looks like based on you know who's going to be the fourth. For, uh, another name that actually came down today was Ryan Sweeney, who I assume you would have some familiarity with as well. Did not spend any time in the in affiliated ball last year, I don't believe. I think he's 30, played some center field, and he, he spent some time with the Cubs, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, and uh, he'll constantly flash promise. He will get hurt a lot, and uh, he will put on amazing batting practice shows and then have zero in-game power. Wow. He's, he's a fun guy. That's incredible. It, it, Again, another fourth outfield candidate, I think, between Benson, Mastriani, and Sweeney. They've kind of got the market cornered on low-end fourth outfield talent. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't imagine that any one of them is the favorite, and maybe they'll just go with RC and Santana. But there are some names there. And then finally, today it came down that the Twins had signed Fernando a- uh, Abed? Abed or Abed? Abad. Abad. So I, I'm getting completely wrong. Uh, pretty good left-handed reliever to a minor league deal. He's under club control until the end of the 2017 season. The Athletics non-tendered him. And so there's some level of intrigue there as a left-hander who can strike out eight guys per nine. And I think his walk rate's right around you know two to two and a half to three. So there's something there. But at the same time, you look at the batting lines that he gives up and seems to give up a lot of extra base hits. So it's kind of all or nothing with him. What's What's been your vision of him, Matt? If I'm remembering right, the deal with him is you just can't let him face a righty unless the margin is eight runs either way, and it doesn't matter at sure. all. Sure. So he's strictly... <laughs> I mean, the, the numbers look flashy, and it's especially for a Twins fan or a Twins person who's been watching, you know, the likes of Brian Dunsing and, and Josh Renicky come out of that bullpen, you know, just kind of low-ceiling relief options. The Twins seem to sign three or four of those you know, every single offseason, and, and he's no exception. It, it is a higher ceiling option than Brian Dunsing, I think that's fair to say. More missed bats. Yeah. More missed bats, which is something this Twins bullpen drastically needs to do. Moving Trevor May to the bullpen obviously helps in that sense. Any, anything you guys see here that really trips your trigger as, hey, that could really pan out? No, I mean, it's just kind of a typical Twins offseason. Par for the course. Right? Yeah, where you go out and get four or five guys in each area that you need and you kind of run your way through them until one sticks. And, you know, they usually do a pretty good job of having 20% of the guys that, that they select, you know, one or two of those guys it seems like they'll have at least a decent season and kind of, you know, make up for that. So well, I think that's where it's going to go. And they did it with Jared Burton and they did it with Casey Fien. You could go on the lower end with Brian, uh, Blaine Boyer, excuse me, who didn't embarrass himself last year. You know, he had the flashy ERA, got some ground balls, but was, you know, as a, a sixth or seventh guy out of the bullpen, you know, someone that can throw the front innings, teams would probably take a chance on him. You don't want him throwing the eighth inning or anything like that. But is what you're seeing with this strategy, building a bullpen, and not necessarily going after the guys like Tony Sip or, or higher? I mean, Sip, Sip is probably in the middle tier, you know, as far as relievers in the game today. He's, he's not a Andrew Miller. He's not a Dellen Pedansis. Batances, excuse me, or anything like that. But they've, again, concentrated on low end. Does that give you a feeling that they're like, okay, the back end of the bullpen is pretty much set with May, Jepsen, Perkins. We feel that the kids are pretty close in Birdie, in Jay, in Reed, Chagua, anybody else who they feel is possibly close from the lefties added to the 40-man roster. Uh, what what do you think is this the, the idea behind this bullpen strategy? Is it that they don't want to get locked into big league commitments with all this this basically this glut of arms coming up? Yeah, and I, I think it's just we've learned with pitchers too that there are injuries and you have to have kind of backup plans. I, sure, I think they're looking at major league talent. But Cole, you said this a couple of weeks ago. They're not. It's not like the Twins are really aiming this off season to get like a game breaking player, right? And that's kind of what they need. Like they're at that stage. Well, and and that's that's so rarely been their goal in the bullpen is you know they they don't go out and make huge acquisitions and this is one where you got a couple guys who are maybe going to do the job and they might have career seasons and that's kind of what they always hope for they always get those retreads that they hope they can get one season out of and then if during that season they 
have some prospect come up and he solidifies his job. Well, then you can dump that player or the guy that you acquired this off season because you don't have, you don't have much money in, in them. And you know, it's an easy guy to, to shove off or you move someone else out. And you know, that's kind of what they always do. I think that was the hope with Boyer too was okay. Boyer's basically a house of cards that will topple over when one of these kids is ready. And then none of the kids, you know, birdie took a step back and got sent from double A to single A Reed did the same Tyler J. I don't think it was ever realistic to expect him to do a, a Chris Sale or anything like that and, and blitz through and, and debut in the same year like they thought might, maybe Mark Appel was going to do. But I, I think what happened was Boyer was just there. You know, they, they had planned for him to be supplanted, maybe get traded to a, a contender if the Twins weren't contending for someone who needed, you know, just a, a front-end arm. And so that might be the goal again this year in the sense that hopefully at least two of the kids – can make that jump. And then, again, not be burdened with being thrown into the fire with the seventh, eighth, or ninth inning role right away. When have the Twins ever handed a role like that to uh, a young guy? For, in, ad- in addition, we you know said, as far as free agent market goes, I don't know if the Twins have ever given a multi-year deal to a reliever as a free agent. I, I, I can't remember one. Can, yeah, I, can you I, I don't one? think so. Not at the time. Yeah, and, uh, and the game's changed, though, and that's the issue. Like, it's okay for a starter to go five innings now because a, a team like Kansas City just has all these fireballers. They roll out. And, the, and these relievers are getting more money, right? It's more common to give a multi-year deal yeah. with that kind of money. The bigger issue with me is the Twins don't need to w- win the offseason. I don't care about that. But where's Birdie? Where's Reed? You mentioned all these guys. Alex Myers in AAA at 27. Yeah, we have, we still know. haven't talked about Alex Yeah, Myers. Yeah, tri- I'm the only one bringing him up, right? And it's just because it's in the back of my head it's saying, why aren't they developing pitching? And that that concerns me because that's a like institutional, organizational issue. It, look, if they don't want to spend in the offseason, yeah, if you're fine, not going to sign but, it, you have, it has to come from somewhere. Yeah, yeah, and that's the issue. I don't, I just don't want them to patch it together. Where you know what, it was great seeing Aaron Thompson do what he did, but it didn't last. You no, know, they play, ran him into the ground like we had discussed. Yeah. They were going to do. Oh yeah, he was, was on the invite. He was on the invite list too. He'll be back this year. Yeah, yeah, and and hopefully, hopefully he can get a shot because he did a great job in those first two months. But when you get thrown out in the game, literally every other day. For two months, I mean, how you can't sustain that for yeah. for a six month season, and and that that's what happened to him. And I even texted him and told him that <laughs> you better ask for some off days, yeah. or else you're not going to be up there at the end of the season. Well, he didn't. He got sent. He got sent home at the end of the AAA season because he pitched poorly there too, and you know that that's what will happen. Yeah, he just, he just he just got burned out. Yeah, I think the frustrating thing, and, and this will lead into the Cubs discussion that we have, is with the Twins' approach to free agency, they've kind of dipped their toes in with the new revenues from the the quote-unquote new ballpark that they're entering year number, was it seven now? Uh, 2010 to 2016 would be seven seasons, I think. So it's, it's, it's a little strange. It's like if you're not going to dive into free agency, as I think fans expected with all these new revenue streams, you know, dipping your toes in to get options like Ricky Nolasco and Irvin Santana at a time when you're, you're finally starting to develop pitchers in the sense that Tyler Duffy was a pop-up guy, you know, not expected to be a, a, a decent piece. You know, it's, it's a little odd that that's... That you're, now you're going to be filled with a glut of so-so pitchers, and, and Irvin Santana might start a third playoff game for a good, a decent team, maybe. You know, but Ricky Nolasco is not that guy. Uh, how Phil Hughes pitched this last year, he's not that guy. Now you've got three guys who may or may not be part of even your medium-term plans that you're paying big money to, and if you consolidate those as as a single asset cash-wise, it's like, man, you know, that's where you can put another twenty million into a Jason Hayward, a an elite level talent, which is what the Twins I felt like should have been looking to do this offseason. It, it didn't make sense to dive into the the middle tier, you know, especially with the increase in in qualifying offers made. You know, where you're going to have to give up your compensation, uh, a pick for compensation. I just I felt like the Twins needed to be a player on a big free agent or just set the market out. And I guess in a sense they have, but I think too watching the Cubs do what they've done has kind of increased the frustration around here because. For whatever reason, Twins fans perceive them to be the same kind of market as Chicago, which is preposterous. But also, the rebuild is kind of on a similar timeline from, I think, when the bottom fell out and, and the building started happening. Yeah. I I think the word that got tossed around, I think during our break and not on the air, but conservative is what jumps out to you about the Twins and about Terry Ryan all mm-hmm. the time. And uh, actually to kind of tie this in with the Cubs. The Twins and the Cubs both started their rebuilds at basically the end of 2011, after the Twins crashed and burned and the Cubs were 
fizzling out from their <laughs> competitive window at the end of the, the 2000s. Um, they were both in a position to kind of get aggressive about a rebuild, but with the Twins, it's always been half speed, and the Cubs were able to turn totally turn over a new leaf and try something radical and get aggressive. Um, the Cubs are like the, um, like a Mexican cartel just collecting arms, whereas it felt like Terry Ryan was just kind of like the tortoise. You know, it was just kind of this, like this worked in 1991, this worked in 1997 <laughs> when we traded Chuck Knobloch. You know what the key year is? It worked in 1985. It worked in 1985 when Andy McPhail was in charge of the right. Twins. Twi- and, and, and he Terry hired, was a scout. Yep. Yeah, and he hired Terry Ryan. And he told Terry Ryan to hire the guys he wanted. And he hired Jim Rance and Mike Radcliffe Mm -hmm. and a couple other guys. And those names are still in this organization now. 20 years, those were the only voices in the room. Yep. Uh, And McPhail moved on to, I don't know if you guys remember, the Cubs. Cubs. And now the Orioles, I think, right? Uh, Yeah. Uh, Well, and now the Phillies. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say he's But McPhail moved on to the Cubs and brought that same conservatism to them for more than a decade and hired Jim Hendry and said, Jim, hire a couple of guys. That's all you need. And they, the Cubs soft pedaled their way through too, with a little more splashy spending because it's Chicago. But it's the same problem. You have to be flexible. You have to be opportunistic. You have to be systematic. And those are not the things. Those aren't Andy McPhail's strengths. They're not Terry Ryan's strengths. And so, because the Cubs finally flushed all that out and brought in Epstein and Hoyer and made a huge front office and started doing things in a whole new way. They are those things now. They're the model of those things. Virtual twins, 180. Virtual 180 from what they were doing. Completely. The twins still aren't those things. The twins are still conservative, still plumbing the middle of the free agent market because that's where they perceive safety. But there is no safety in the middle of the free agent market. All there is is a cap ceiling. When you Ricky sign Nolasco. Ricky Nolasco, he's not going to blow up into a great pitcher. You're just hoping he doesn't crater. And he has. Because yeah. that's what happens a lot in the middle of the free agent market. You have to shop at the top or the bottom because that's where there's upside. And they did that and with the Phil tw- Hughes, but then, they du- but then they doubled down on it by giving him yeah. an extension. Because they, they got one good season out of him and didn't see all of the things that said, this is real, but it's not totally real. They looked right past those things and they invested too much in him. Mm-hmm. And now even that good investment has turned sour. So. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I, I like the idea of targeting under thirty free agents that are coming off of bad seasons, just because it's a it's a raw talent. You know, like a, a Colby Rasmus was the guy I was banging the drum for last off season. Again, nobody thought he could play center. Nobody thought he could make contact. But at twenty eight years old, who knows what he could do? It worked out for the Astros. Again, the Twins didn't end up needing outfielders because Eddie Rosario emerged, and it panned out. But that's kind of the theory. Like, if you're going to take risks and you're, but you're still kind of afraid, the one-year deal will never, ever do anything to you that you can't just get out of. And the other thing is, who's got a safer job in baseball than Terry Ryan? Like, the, I don't understand what the the perception of risk is when you're not going to get fired. The the question I have is, I don't mind them taking risks on guys like Pelfrey, who's a first rounder, Nunez, who is considered kind of the heir apparent, right, to Jeter. And he's at one been point. And, and he had a fine season in 2015. Um, you know, even an Aaron Thompson, who was a first round pick, you know, way back when. Are you sure? <laughs> I am writing. Tom, a story Tom's been writing a story about <laughs> Marlins first round picks from 2005. Oh, oh five, yeah, for about yeah. the last year. So I, I'm just yeah. I'm just rubbing uh, ribbing you a little bit. So I'm fine with that, but then don't run Thompson in the ground. Don't extend Pelfrey two more years you know what I mean like if, if he came back for one more year maybe you could see it but they really like doubled down on Pelfrey and I felt like they were bidding against themselves I don't think anybody else was going to give Pelfrey two years now then again he got 16 million two years 16 million they're going right, to make him a Tigers. reliever in Detroit before the end of that contract yeah and mark my words it will be just fine he'll be a he'll be a final he's not going to be I don't think he'll be a stud but he'll be a, he'll be a reliever that'll be better than a you know much better than he is a starter so you have that and then you have um you know Phil Hughes, so I think they killed it. But you know, on the first contract, yeah. and then double down. It, it just seems like the the first move is correct. The first move to try to get kind of these recycled first rounders is good. What they do afterwards, you know, obviously has not panned out, and that that's a frustration. And yeah, it'd be nice. You know, with Nolasco at the time, I liked it. I said, look, they need a pitcher like that. It's really hard to get guys to come to Minnesota because they're they're just not very good right now. Right, and 
the issue is why when that doesn't work out do you go back and do it again? You know, with Santana, who I think Santana will be a better player. Much but better. But yeah, the PED suspension. And it, the other problem I have with that is they always talked about durability, and he's younger than he is, right? He's younger than a 30-year-old player. Well, maybe that's because of the PEDs he was taking, right? You know, I, I mean, mean, he came up young, so I, don't, I just I never understood that talking point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And so I just I don't think th- that that's the frustration. It's the second move that really throws me off, and it's why mm-hmm. are you – because with Phil Hughes, if he was on that initial contract, you go, okay, it's a prove-it year this year, right? It would be the third year of his third year or three-year contract. Yeah. Now you say, you know, you're stuck, and now I think he's going to be good. Yeah, but if he's not, be, I think he'll be fine if he's healthy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think he was worse than he is last year. I think he was better than he is two years ago. If that makes sense. Yeah, I agree with that. Let's let's do this. Let's pause, and when we come back, we will do a little compare and contrast and go true blood heavy on the third segment, talking about the Cubs on the breakdown. Just when you thought it was safe to go back online, along comes this hit show. <laughs> Do you want to do this? I will do this. Are Jamie, we let's not this? battle our best. No, I was, no. Oh, Bill, I, you're, you're being nice. Yeah. In a world full of hit shows, this one's the real deal. I'm refusing to I engage in an argument that I'm doesn't not exist. I'm not arguing. <laughs> Twin Cities hit show. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hey, See, I, this is how fights start on pedal pubs. This is exactly. exactly. <laughs> he's he's just whole, he's all that, all that red-headed I'll anger just came up. It's I, all in his I, chest I, right I, now. The Twin Cities Hit Show airs live daily, 9.30 to 10.30, on the Alive and Social Network. Oh, Be Shannon, heard. welcome to my world. All right, let's bring it down to the home stretch. Episode number 18, last one before the holidays, before 2016. want to thank the Alive and Social Network for giving us a chance to put this on, Cole. I think it's been pretty fun doing these shows so far. Yeah, it's been a really good time. We did a lot of fun stuff this year. The drone videos, which incidentally we haven't seen yet, but... They should be coming out soon. I'm getting getting psyched to see what the finished project's going to be. Matt, if you didn't know, we've been working on baseball instructionals. Obviously, I've been the star, and Cole has been the <laughs> yes. enhancement talent. The guy the magician's not, assistant. Yeah, 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 exactly. Assistant to the regional manager. And right. so <laughs> between 18 episodes of the podcast and I think 10 instructionals, we've had, we've had some fun yeah, definitely. this year, and, and hopefully that can continue into next year. We appreciate all the support from everybody listening, from, from Sean, from Jackie, who has departed the network, I understand. We've had a lot of great support from the network, and it's fun to see where this has all come from, which is from me just helping out on Twins Tuesday a little bit out at Floyd's, and it's evolved into something really fun. So you know, hopefully, cheers to a, a better 2016 after a pretty good 2015. So uh, Matt, obviously the the ulterior motive that I had bringing you here was to talk about the Cubs. You're one of the, the foremost voices on hashtag baseball Twitter uh, about the Cubs, I, what I want to talk about is is part of you know how the Cubs rebuild has been different than the Twins. Honestly, it, to find a similarity is is probably that they both drafted decently well. But I think for, from a Cubs fan standpoint, you've got pretty much the perfect mix of international signings, draft, free agency. You've got buy low chances that have taken off, like a Trevor Cahill. Take us through your vision of how this rebuild has gone for the Cubs and, and how it's anything but a smashing success. Sure. So just going back to when it first got off the ground, the Cubs got a little bit lucky in that they had new ownership, which, boy, the Twins could maybe use. But well, we'll, yeah, we'll <laughs> get to that later. Wow. Uh, they had new ownership Shots in place. Shots fired, I guess. And those new owners, the Ricketts family, wanted to change things. Sure. They weren't satisfied with, what they perceived as sort of a stagnated model and a, an organization that was a little behind the times in terms of the manpower they were putting into player development and scouting and an analytics that was behind the times drastically in terms of facilities. They wanted to upgrade everything, and they wanted someone who could handle doing all of it. And they got very lucky that the Red Sox fell apart at the end of the 2011 season, and so Theo Epstein was kind of ready to step out that door. They went and got him, and 
ever since, it's basically been Epstein tearing the Cubs down to the studs and rebuilding them, uh, not just as a major league roster, but as an organization. Uh, they've, they now have a world-class facility in the Dominican Republic, the state-of-the-art at uh, in Arizona, spring training complex that just completely built from scratch, and it's mm -hmm. enormous. And obviously, they're doing this radical renovation of Wrigley Field right now. What do you think about that? It's awesome, frankly, and mm -hmm. it's something, I think, to a lot of the country, it looks pretty out of left field and a little bit even off-putting in places. Um, for Chicagoans, we have been hearing about grand plans to renovate and update and modernize Wrigley Field without losing its charm since I was like nine years old. <laughs> uh, and there would be, you know, they'd put out copies of the team magazine that had these beautiful renderings of, well, there's going to be this great plaza next to the ballpark and you'll be able to, you know, see a video screen that doesn't impose on the Ivy covered walls and all of that. And it just never happened because the owners at the time had no interest in making that level of capital investment. Uh, but it's happening now, and it's it's great. Every change they've made, even the ones that have been questioned up front by fans, have been wildly popular. So even the rebuild has not been strictly player-wise, but uh, to the stadium. But, but anyway, back to the players. Yeah. In, in your in your view, in your in your thoughts, it's it's gone well, pretty pretty clearly. It, incredibly, the, they've set about it exactly the way I would. They go out. They went out every winter while they were rebuilding, and they looked for guys who could turn into more valuable assets. Sometimes that meant a guy that they thought was being undervalued and could really become an anchor for them and maybe be around by the time they were good again. But mostly it meant guys like Paul Mahalam, Scott Feldman. Jason Hamill, they actually Jason flipped Hamill. and then brought back, if I'm not mistaken, exactly. in the Addison Russell deal. It was every year they were signing a pitcher or two to fill into their starting rotation for one year and $6 million. It was like clockwork. And those guys would turn into, by July, they'd be trading them off for, you know, it was, it was uh, Scott Feldman was the centerpiece of the deal that brought the Cubs, Jake Arrieta, and Pedro Stroh. Which is pretty incredible when you think about Jake Arrieta, the, the Cy Young Award winner from this past season. Uh, to, to take a brief pause, like, isn't that kind of the, the risks you'd, you guys would like to see the Twins take, you know, being a little more risk-averse in, in that sense? I, <clears throat> it would be nice to see that, but I just I don't see it happening because they had success this last year at kind of what they've always done. And so because of that, you know, if, if it seems like it's working, why are you going to change it? I and, think, and, and knowing that organization the way I do, I, it's just it's not going to happen. I think they might be allowing themselves to be victimized by their own success after this last year when it was it was kind of serendipitous success of like, Amazing sequencing. 20 you know. and 7 May, right? Yeah, and yeah. the rest of the season, they were literally, what, like six games under 500 or something, seven, eight, I don't know. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but they were not over 500 outside of that month. Now, you can pick and choose months and days and stuff, and that's that's not really true to you know the fact that you can't take away wins once you've got them. But it does feel to me like, you know, you're, 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 you, know you get fat and happy, and then when you step on the scale, you weren't as heavy as you thought you were. And it's just like uh, not good. The question I have: What did ha what did Hayward sign for? Well, it's basically a, an eight year. It's a Joe Mauer contract. So, this but is it's, my point. Yeah. But it's stripped down to what is it? Three and seventy eight if he opts out. Yeah, it's three and seventy eight. Although twenty million of that will be deferred into post, like years five through eight after he's gone. And he but but out. post media post uh, TV deal, the Cubs are going to hit their new TV deal in twenty twenty. And so after that, uh, basically any Cubs obligation that stretches past really the 2018 season, I, you, you count it in Monopoly money because the Cubs are Dodgers money. an extremely rich team who are about to get wildly richer. Um, and it's really not going to matter, especially with the young core that they have in place. Mm -hmm. They've timed it so well that they have these guys. Um, Anthony Rizzo, who's on a really team-friendly extension. Amazing deal. Uh, Chris Bryant, Addison Russell, Kyle Schwarber, Jorge Soler, they're all on these, they're all so early in their careers that they're making like zero money. Mm -hmm. And just when they start to make even some money through arbitration, 
it's still going to be tamped down by that process and the money is just going to be flying from the TV deal. And so they have this window where they can spend on Jason Hayward and Ben Zobrist and John Lackey in one winter because the guys who are really powering their team, like 20 wins of value in their in the middle of their lineup, are costing them a total of like $8 million. And this is what my theory was about why you need to supplement Bucks and Snow when they're cheap, was if you sign a guy to a five-year deal now, you're still not... Even if the Twins are on their old school cheapish, cheapish, uh, you know, quotes budget, you're not going to keep yourself from signing them in their free agent years if you wait that long. If you supplement them with a guy on a five year deal now, granted, I don't know who I don't, it, that's all a straw man. I don't know who you're going to sign to do that, but it's why you got to supplement your, your players when they're young because then you have the freedom to do that. Yeah, and I think the Maurer deal comes up right about the time that you'd have to sign Bucks and Snow, Also right? accurate, yes. So here's my bigger point here. That I don't think the Twins can go out and make a ton of mistakes, a la the Dodgers. The Cubs are kind of getting to that point. Arizona goes Yankees. out and gets cranky. Yankees the old, the your... older Yankees. The Yankees have actually yeah. you know, they've been, they've remained pretty – actually, I, re- I saw a thing that the, the Twins spent a higher percentage of their revenue this last season than the Yankees did. Really? I don't know how accurate the chart was, and obviously they have a lot more. But yeah. from a percentage standpoint – Twins fans aren't going to want to hear that. So, so here, here's my point: is that I think you know the Cubs can maybe make a few more mistakes than other teams can just because of this excess revenue. But when the Twins fans dog the Maurer contract, I go, man, you signed that hands down when you have this new stadium when mm-hmm. how Maurer was playing. And people say he wasn't good; he was good in ten, right? When mm-hmm. they had a good year, great, he's, he's great in ten, gr- great in twelve. Good at 13 until he got injured. Yep. And now he's pedestrian. Sure. That's after a concussion. That's years new. But how many big deals are signed in free? No, he wasn't a free agent. True. But how many years in in free agent deals like that in free agency are signed where years five, six, and seven are a wash and that you're going to maximize your value up front? Before considering all the the extra value the Twins were playing with when he was basically an indentured servant. Yeah. And so, like, you know, you look at the David Price deal that was not signed for the end of that deal, right? $270 million. Now there's opt out clauses and stuff, I know, but. He's not going to be worth that when he's 35, right? And he's probably going to take the money because why would you leave that much money on the table when you're a 30-ish no, you know, reliever no, or no, starter, I mean? Here's what's funny to me, and I want to pose this back to Matt as we go back to our is, is we, also talk, we also talk about mistakes on the free agent market. Are you, more, are you more afraid of putting money towards a big free agent and having it blow up or a mid-level free agent and having it blow up? No, and what's a, what's a more realistic fear? Going after high-end players and them fizzling out or going after players who weren't that great to begin with and fizzling out. I, uh, you know, it's sometimes it's a misplaced idea of where you're actually committing the most risk. Like, are you more worried about Clayton Kershaw blowing out his arm, or are you more worried about Ricky Nolasco spending these next two years rolling around on a cart like he did for the large par- portion of 2015? Yeah. and that's, there's, there's that risk. And that's my thing. You probably know the exact number. I believe the Twins started as the 20th biggest payroll or something like that last year Mm -hmm. so this notion that because you have nolasco and because you have maurer you can't sign players is ridiculous i mean a lot of teams it is it is protecting the pockets of the ownership yeah and and i understand that in this market owners aren't going to go out and be the dodgers right because of the television deal maybe the wilfs with brett Favre. that's about the last time you can really yeah or or the wild with Suter and parisi those are big contracts yeah and the wild have not turned a profit i believe like they would have to Maybe they did last year or something like that, but they took some a lot of risk bringing those two guys. But what I like about the Cubs is instead of trying to do kind of what the Dodgers did, where it seems like they brought in all their free agents kind of at once, they're, they built their young core up first, and then they go and make the splash. So that's why I, you know, I said this off the air, but usually you don't win the, you know, the offseason and then the regular season. You look at you know San Diego last year or whatever. But this is, I think this is going to work because, look, if Hayward doesn't pan out, that whole contract doesn't, it's not going to cripple the And the cost. odds of that are not very, very yeah. high. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, and, and you have all this young talent, just like the Twins do with, if Buxton pans out, you're going to get him out of value. If Sano pans out, you're going to get him out of value. Park, you're getting out of value. I know he's not a young player, but a guy who's supposed to bring a lot of power potential. Yeah, there's there's no risk of him hurting you enough to outweigh the, the possibility that he hits 25 home runs and provides you value. So that's where the Twins probably shouldn't be cheap like with relievers. You know what I mean? I yeah. mean, that, that, uh, you know, I guess that's the that's same where I'm time, going there's a it. non-zero chance that Abad is better than Tony Sip next year. Definitely. So yeah. uh, what I want to ask you, do you really believe that Hayward will play center? And how does that change his value? I do at this point. Um, it doesn't sound like they're eager to trade Jorge Soler and the way the starting pitching trade market moved after the Shelby Miller lunacy. Um, that was crazy. Yeah. 
I don't think that they're expecting to move Solaire at this point. Mm-hmm. And that puts him in right field, Kyle Schwarber in left, uh, and pretty much secures Hayward in center. And I don't think it changes his value a lot. It's going to change the shape of his value a bit just because when you're, you know, a center fielder is a little more valuable than a right fielder just because they're harder to replace defensively. Mm -hmm. Um, And so assuming he hits the same way, it's going to be more valuable to have his bat out there. He's not going to be as good a fielder. But the big thing with the Cubs is that Wrigley Field has the fourth smallest center field in baseball by square footage. Uh, It's not a lot of ground to cover. So if 81 games a year, you can put a guy out there and just ask him to cover that smaller real estate, it, it's kind of like being a corner outfielder anyway. Uh, so I'm I'm not worried, and I don't think the Cubs are terribly worried about Hayward out there. He's played some center in the past, both in Atlanta and in St. Louis. And I think even though he's a big guy and he sort of strikes you as someone who belongs in a corner, uh, he'll fit in center for plenty long enough. And I think in the long run, they're probably planning – either that he's going to opt out after three years anyway, or that Solaire is going to be trade bait somewhere in that interim and he'll slide over to right. And you, you kind of made my point for me that the deals now aren't hurting their future, both from a standpoint of when guys' contracts come up and when their money comes to, to, to roost. Uh, so so I'm going I'm to skip over that and move on to the next thing. I, I did see a Fangraphs headline that said, Cubs as the MLB's best team. Now that's in reflection of the moves that they've made so far. And guys, I'll throw this to you first. I think you could have made the case as the Cubs' as MLB's best team the second that Alex Gordon filed for free agency. What do you guys think? You know, once once the Royals, in theory, lost Alex Gordon, I don't think they're going to re-sign him. I think that automatically vaults the Cubs kind of to the, the best team before they had added any more talent. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. I, I mean, he's... Alex Gordon was a marquee player. He He's their heart and soul from a so many different standpoints in terms of defense, in terms of playing. Definitely. And, and so that that doesn't surprise me. And I, th- I think it's going to be really interesting to see what they do to try and fill that gap with what the Royals do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think of who would kind of be in competition for that. You know, the Dodgers, you can't completely rule out. The Toronto, I think, you know, played really well last year. Sure. Um, now, they're, they're without price, too, though, which... Yeah, and so. that's that's true. And, 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 you know, the Astros are an up-and-coming team who I think they're making a push, too, right? They're starting to make trades and kind of put the you know pedal to the metal. Well, they're in bit. the talk for Fernandez. They're in the conversation. I don't know if that's actual thing, but... But, I, I, you know, I look at it this way. I think a lot of teams, especially Cubs fans, and you know this, look at what could go wrong. And if you look at what reasonably could go wrong with the Cubs, it's like they are not going to be that bad. You know what I mean? Like, worst case right. scenario, like Pittsburgh maybe takes a division or something like this. But, you know, it's that's the thing. When you look at the Twins, you go, what could reasonably go wrong with the Twins? You go, man, they could go back to a 75-win team next year easily, right? You know, that's probably where they were. Someone ran the stats and said, take that May out of there. And now, obviously, 27, that was a... Fun, fun no, month. They, they played at like a 75 win pace outside yes, of that month. Yes. And, and that's my thing is that, you know. Or I think I ran that in like August. Okay. So so that's my point is I think, you know, when you can go and take risk like this, which the casual Cubs fan who's not digging into the numbers is still excited. With, you know, you took the guy from St. Louis, right? right. That's going to get everyone jacked Two up. guys. Two guys. Lackey that's right. Too. They got lackey too. So yeah. And, and they, you know, even they were on the cover of Sports Illustrated right last year with, uh, I'm trying to think. Lester. Yeah, yeah, Lester. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think it's the, when you can win both those battles where the, you know, the inside baseball people are like, man, these are smart moves. And, and someone from Chicago can say, hey, I'm happy to be a Cubs fan. That That's great. And then when you can also, you know, get the marginal fan who's like, hey, I'm going to come to the ballpark just to see this Hayward guy, right? Or that, Chris that, Bryant that's when brilliance he's young. in every sense of the word. Really. Yeah. Um, we're, we're starting to run low on time. In fact, we're probably over time. So I'm going to. Probably try to go rapid fire with these last few, but I want to get a few more Cubs thoughts out of here. Are we, are sure. we doing good on time, boys? Yeah. Okay. One year in, Joe Madden, your thoughts, Matt? <laughs> He's been great. You know, he, every manager has some tactical shortcomings. That's just how manage it. That's the state of managing. But Madden is phenomenal at managing the clubhouse and the grind of the season. That's no complaints. Yeah, I've been a big fan. Uh, the bullpen was weird for them late in the season last year, I thought, with – Guys like Cahill and Fernando Rodney, but he seemed to massage all that masterfully. Yeah, I yeah. mean, in a, in a way where it was literally just pulling names out of a hat. Okay, you've got the seventh inning tonight, and then the postseason, it was you know starters three four innings and then doing the same kind of thing. And you know, granted, it didn't pan out in getting them to the World Series, but I think he did an awful lot with with what he had. Yeah, is, is bullpen kind of the last quote unquote flaw that that team has to address right now? It's the thing that. 
is easiest to upgrade for them at this point. They have a strong bench. Obviously, the lineup is pretty well locked in. Um, they could, you know, there are enough good options out there that I could see them upgrading sort of the middle of the starting rotation. Mm -hmm. But it's always easiest to improve your bullpen because any pitcher you add to it bumps the worst player on your team, basically that seventh or eighth reliever off of it. What, what have you been your thoughts about Jake Arietta's emergence? He's been incredible. Yeah, Arietta's amazing. And I stayed skeptical for longer than most uh, just because I sort of naturally am suspicious of that sort of sudden sudden leap in, in sure. performance. But the things he does, uh, his ability to, you know, it's like a 90-mile-an-hour slider, and he's got two different fastballs. It's almost fast like it was a Worthen slider from the Mets almost. Yeah, exactly. And and late in the season, guys sort of started to be able to sit on his curveball, which is sick, but they, right. you know, when they knew it was coming, they could sort of do things with it. So he just invented a changeup on the fly. And I, I don't <laughs> you, know what do to that? do with this monstrous <laughs> no. mountain of a man who can throw 97 and has a 90-mile-an-hour slider, and his fastball can go either of two directions. And so unless he gets hurt, he's going to be killer. Yeah, I, I agree with that. One year in, John Lester, what have been your thoughts? I Again, I think from a traditional standpoint, his numbers were a little disappointing. But from a sabermetric standpoint, everyone's like, yeah, he, he pitched better than the numbers looked like. Was that your perception as well? Yeah, Lester, is, he's basically a testament to what can be achieved if you're terrible at everything about baseball except actually pitching. He's a really, really good pitcher. He can just work the edges of the zone beautifully. He's got a myriad of pitches. He's got good command of all of them. He's smart as hell. Uh, he can't throw to first base. Yeah, that's he can't so feel this position. He can't hit. He can't run. <laughs> he's not even that smart Like once the ball's in play. It's like you started talking about me halfway through the sentence. <laughs> but, but he's just... He's... Um, he's an amazing pitcher, and it, it's r actually really, really fun to watch him overcome all of his shortcomings by just having a lot of guts, a lot of smarts, and being able to execute his delivery over and over and over. Who would have ever thought you'd say those things about a $100 million pitcher? But I digress. 150 Oh, my gosh. I forgot it was that much. Uh, Zobris deal, a uh, uh, slam dunk, I think, in every sense of the word. Uh, the John Lackey deal, what did you think about that? There are people who have concerns about Lackey from like a I makeup like he, standpoint. I thought he didn't really fit the mold of like Hayward and Zobris. And then you, you go for that third punch and it's Lackey and you're like, what? Yeah, a 37-year-old starter yeah. who's kind of famous for being a mouth breather. and like, <laughs> like he, He's the biggest friggin' guy I've ever been on an elevator with. Too. He's a, a little field. bit of he a He gets on the elevator head. and you're just like, good yeah. lord, yeah. he's huge. But... It's it's kind of a lot like Lester. He's a little bit better at the holding runners on type of stuff, and but he just he's a great competitor. He's got a whole bunch of pitches, and he knows how to use them. And his body's held up really well. He's not showing any signs of you know he's going to collapse right he away. He did have a couple year old, vacation so. with the Red Sox, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. The Tommy John that came like at the end of a season, so he really got eighteen he, he got months. He got like a million bucks a start, I think, there for a while or something for that that whole. Like, contract something like that but then at the end because of a, a clause that Theo Which Epstein had worked in when he signed he had to play a season at the major league minimum Seven, uh, did, he make, did he make seven hundred fifty thousand dollars last year I think it's five hundred oh that's yeah I mean, it, it was it was a it weird was, clause where if you missed so much time the the deal went from like 18 million per year to like yeah 500 grand wow. and, and that's what he played there's a team option for the league minimum if his elbow gave out within a certain window and it did <laughs> and so the Cardinals got him last year for virtually nothing. So here's uh, the last thing I want to touch on is is Baez. Is he the the Ben Zobrist of the Cubs? If Ben like, if you forget that Ben Zobrist is who he is and what he used to do, yep. will Baez be the Zobrist of old playing all over, or 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 would you move him for another starter? For instance, maybe you could build a package for Chris Archer hypothetically. Mm -hmm. You'd have to give up more than that, clearly. Maybe maybe, maybe it'd be Baez and Soler. But right. would you do something like that? Or do you see him as a guy who's going to be invaluable in the role that he has? And if you do move him, who's the utility infielder? Yeah. If a top-of-the-rotation starter becomes available, a guy like Archer or Carlos Carrasco, uh, maybe even Jose Fernandez, if that 
price tag comes way way down. <laughs> it's at all, the man, the Marlins man. Yeah, I think they have to consider moving Baez because there's risk in that bat. We've seen tons and tons of strikeouts. Sure. Uh, at the same time, he's a freak. He he hit a pitch that was almost in the catcher's glove before he started swinging. 410 feet the opposite way for a three-run homer in the playoffs off of John <laughs> Lackey. It was insane. He can do that. He's an amazing fielder. Just for a guy who at the plate seems so sort of undisciplined and wild and the swing is, is hilarious to watch, mm -hmm. um, in the field, he's an excellent executor and he's got a rocket is arm, it arm? Is it? it's everything okay. second base shortstop third base and they've got him working out in center field this year in in winter ball he's a phenomenal fielder so if they believe in the bat he's almost too much to move no matter what the price sure but i do think they're they're aware of the risk that comes with that much swing and miss and so they might move on from him if they do uh brendan ryan is the player that they got sort of the secondary piece when they traded Starlin Castro to the Yankees. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. And so Ryan would slide into that that backup shortstop utility. Well, and, and in a situation like that, you're not going to try to use that guy that much, and you could still right. move Ben Zobrist if you had to. Right. Okay, well, that's a wrap for the breakdown for the year 2015. Again, want to thank everybody for joining us today, for instance, and also for the entire year. Uh, stay tuned. We're going to hopefully have some pretty great stuff coming around here at the beginning of 2016, so for former Twins right-hander Cole DeVries, Cold Omaha's Tom Schreier, the A-Train Aaron Tro, and our special guest today, Matt Trueblood, and all our great guests from this last year, this is Brandon Warren signing off saying thanks for joining us on The Breakdown. Have a happy and healthy holiday season and a great new year.